Hey, good day. Welcome to Cooking Something Good. I'm your host, Dave Dusso. I've got my JBJ, my JBJ jacket on. It's the jacket I go to. You're supposed to pull it down in the back, I've been told. Pull it down in the back so it doesn't bunch up. I literally don't care uh, if it bunches up. Great show today. I'm really excited. I've been trying to get uh, this chef on the show for a long time. Long time friend of mine, too. Uh, he's been really, really busy. And he found time for us today, and I am extremely thankful. His name is Chef Kevin Cousins. He owns a restaurant I talk about all the time on this show. It's called Tosca. It's in Suffield, Connecticut, and it is truly one of my favorite restaurants. And he is a fascinating uh, man with a uh, long cooking history. And I don't think I've ever met anyone who studies more about food than Chef Cousins. Nice, nice guy. Great chef. Great restaurant. Tosca restaurant and um, everything else is good except for, I don't get this. I was in my hometown, Northampton, Massachusetts the other day and I was going to drive down King Street. I actually did drive down King Street. I was heading to Sutter's. Nice little meat market right on uh, King Street. It's a butcher shop. They've got great stuff. Anyway, there's about seven stoplights, and every single stoplight I got to was red, and I was the first person in line every time, and it was long. Everyone was long. Why can't they coordinate and synchronize the stoplights where you're going down the street? So if you're going the speed limit, you never stop, and if you stop once, it's the only time you're going to stop because it's going to go. And then if an ambulance or fire truck or a police car or an emergency vehicle goes and it screws it all up, after a cycle, it goes back to being synchronized again. It would make life easier. It would make life less stressful. It would be better for the environment. It doesn't seem that hard to do. We're taking pictures of things on Mars, but we can't synchronize the lights on our street. I just wanted to get to Sutter's. I wanted the filet. I wanted to get back. I wanted to have time to cook. <sighs> Chef Cousins. Please, please help me relax. And just like magic, we're back in the Jones Barbecue Studio. Jones Barbecue, Deb and Mary Jones. Little place in Kansas City, Kansas. It's just a shack. And it's the best barbecue sauce I've ever had in a bottle anyway. And it's one of the best barbecue sauces I've ever had in my life. The Jones sistered, sisters sell hundreds of thousands of these bottles every single year out of that little tiny shack in Kansas City, Kansas. They were featured on Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, and they were featured on the Steve Harvey Show. I had them on my show, two of my favorite people ever. But that's not important right now. We've got Chef Kevin Cousins from Tosca. Chef, welcome to the show. Thank you. I've been trying to get you on forever. You're one of my heroes. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hey, I got to tell you something. I have this thing. Thing that happens to me every once in a while where I go to a restaurant. It happens so often when I go to your restaurant, but it happened the other night when I went. You, There's something. It's, it's either a regular menu item. In this case, it was a special that puts me in this orgasmic kind of place. I'm like in an orgasmic coma, incapable of, of hearing people talking to me, incapable of stopping uh, and if you kept feeding me, I would eat until I died. The other day you had salmon roulette. My God. Riet. 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 Unbelievable. Thank you so much. Unbelievable. Uh, what, where did that come from? How did you, how'd you come up with that? Well, you know, as I mean, a chef, sometimes, sometimes things are challenging. So they always say that as a chef, you don't pick your ingredients. Your ingredients pick you. Oh, that's, wow. Um. So sometimes you get inspired by certain things. You get inspired by the season. You get inspired by maybe an overabundance of something or maybe a lack of overabundance of something. So when you really study food culture, um, a lot of it has to do with, before refrigeration, preserving things. So that's where you get the smoked and the cured meats uh, because there was lack of refrigeration until the modern century. Um, also, when you study a lot of Italian culture, you have these huge families and the mother, or the nona, which is the grandmother, had to feed eight people, six people. So they had to stretch their budget. So they came up with pasta to fill people up with a little bit of sauce. So, you know, when you look at a lot of the, the dishes, it's uh, a lot of culture goes behind stuff. And I think sometimes when people study the history of food, 
because we've always eaten in, in our civilization, uh, you can get amazed by certain things. So we had some really great fresh salmon that came in and I want to do something different with it. So we cured it, you know, so you use kosher salt with some seasoning and you cure it. And then you wash the, the cure off and you um, let it sit in the walk-in. It's called pectin. It, 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 um, it has like a, 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 a way of air curing it. And then we smoked it and then you make this riette. So if you go to like the south of France, they do duck riette with a duck confit or something. You just spread it on a piece of baguette. Yeah, I've had the pork yeah, before. You have a, yeah, yeah, you have a nice glass of wine and it just takes you back to a time, you know, that very sensual, um, kind of almost primitive, but very just satisfying, soul satisfying kind of food. I, and the presentation was fantastic too. I mean, it added to, and presentation can add to the experience. 100%. And this, this, pre this presentation was great. You know, you talk about culture, food, history, and I was talking, uh, had on my show a couple months ago, one of your, uh, someone you worked for years ago, one of, I think, your early mentors, uh, Damien DiPaola. Oh, absolutely, he's and, one of my mentors. And he he's was a, raving about you. He said, he's I mean, a, He's a huge influence in my life. Uh, you know, when you meet people as passionate as Damien is and who actually really cares about food and the quality that he puts out, uh, they kind of impart or instill that into you as a young chef coming up. Um, but yeah, me and Damien, we still talk to each other. You know, we, you know, I mean, now it's a little bit harder because he's doing his thing. He's acting and he has restaurants in Boston. And, you know, I have my restaurant that I work at um, and own. So, you know, we, we tweet each other, we'll text each other. If I'm in town, I'll go see him and, you know, vice versa. So, you know, he, absolutely. A lot of the, you know, Pioneer Valley, you know, Marwan Yellow, who used to own Pinocchio's and Damien, I want to say a huge influences on me as a young man growing up in Atlanta. Oh, it's funny, his comment about you, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he, he said he knew you were going to be great because even when you were young and first started out, you just always wanted to learn something new and from talking to people at your restaurant and i go often it's in suffield by the way did i mention it's tosca in suffield and it's a restaurant you shouldn't miss uh, they always tell me he is constantly if he's not working which seems like it's every day except for the chance he gets to go out and ride on his harley that he is either reading a cookbook watching a cooking video traveling around the world always learning something new and that was damien's point he is all that you have always had that that desire to learn where'd that come from do you know uh i i don't really i guess my mom she we actually moved to northampton as, as a young man my mom went to smith college so she, i guess she was a seeker of knowledge and i guess that kind of rubs off on me but it was something that you know when i really i think a lot of people when they look at food it's very surface oriented it's the um, a need, you're hungry, I want to eat something. But when you really look into the culture and, you know, the way the animals raise, you know, what's the reason why maybe you make uh, a venison jerky because you just, you know, slaughter an animal and you have to preserve it. You make a hamburger or it's just, for me, it's extremely interesting. So I guess I'm kind of a food nerd, I would say. Um, and I've always wanted to get better. So, you know, I mean, I'm very competitive, I guess, and I want to make sure that, you know, you know, as a black man doing Italian food, uh, I guess my authenticity comes into question. So people say to me, oh, but you're black and you make pasta. And I'm like, well, anyone can do anything. We're in a world economy. I can actually be in, in Italy in six hours, which yeah. I've done. Um, so, you know, I've actually studied with a little Nona in Italy, rolling pasta out every morning, drinking cappuccino. And one of the funny stories is, is that, uh, we were making tortellini and I was chopping some parsley and I wasted a little bit on the cutting board. So there's a little bit on the cutting board and I was gonna take it and put it in the trash and she walks over to me and she goes, sono americano, you're such an American. Like we don't waste stuff like that over here. We're, we're more frugal. We, we make sure that every, and it was just one of those moments, you know? I'm like, here I am in Italy and this lady's like scolding me for wasting a little bit of parsley on the board. Uh, but it was one of those moments that I really realized that the true nature of cuisine is to try to preserve and, and 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 utilize everything you know it's like the you know the farmers go out there they, they grow this parsley they raise these pigs they cure them and it's paying homage to them 
to make sure you use everything and don't waste anything. So, I mean, to wrap it all back up, I guess uh, just my, my, my quest for knowledge and, and, um, and it's, and it's exciting. You know what I mean? Honestly, as a young kid, I'm reading these books about these Michelin star chefs and these people in Europe and all over the world. And I was like, wow, that'd be amazing. And then, you know, 15, 10 years later, I find myself flying to Italy uh, over the Alp Mountains, going to Bologna to study with a lady in, in Italy. And, you know, so for me, it's just one of those surreal moments that it kind of, you know, accommodates all of the hard work, all of the influence and everything into one into one situation. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, I'm going to mention that I travel. I get the opportunity. I'm lucky enough that I get to travel a, a lot all over the world and uh, I get to go to a lot of restaurants and. Tosca is, and you you say you're always learning, you always want to learn, you keep wanting to get better. I got to tell you, I think you're one of the best right now. It's one of my favorite restaurants in the world. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, and that's the truth. And uh, a couple of, you know, I love the fact that when I go there, I know that there's nothing on the menu I don't like. There, every single thing. And I also appreciate the fact that there's always going to be a special that's going to make my life miserable because I have to choose between one of those things I absolutely love off your menu or one of the two or three specials that I love too. You know, I hate getting into any political type thing, but you mentioned as a black man, and it's kind of a funny story. I sent someone there about a year ago and I raved about you. I said, hey, this guy is a genius. It's just, and they love food too. And they went that, oh, we love it. You didn't tell me he was black. And I didn't say anything, but I'm like, who, who cares? It's like, yeah, what does it matter? But, but yeah, for, yeah. for you, what's it, what are the challenges of, of, of being a black man in an industry that, uh, in this area anyway, isn't dominated by, by uh, African-American men or women? Well, I think it also adds a unique flair to my story. Um, so I feel that, you know, if you look at history, everybody has borrowed something from every culture. Italy is very close to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at like the Moroccan flavors, if you look at even Saudi Arabia, they use Zatar, these certain things you can see. And, you know, in all, in all honesty, um, pasta, as we know it, modern day pasta originated in China. Yep. So people have never give the Chinese credit for creating the noodle. Uh, so that's another thing when you, when you, when you devolve, you go deep into it. So, even though I think um, Italians, I'll give them a lot of credit because I love the culture and I love the food in Italy. Just the basic food uh, is amazing. You know, you go to a store and you just get a slice of prosciutto on a little piece of focaccia and, you, and with some olive oil, you're just like, dude, <laughs> that's so a little good. fresh mozzarella. Yeah, you're like, what the fly? So uh, I give them a lot of culture, but, you know, originally noodles came from China. So I think people need to, like, open their minds and understand that if it's done right, it doesn't really matter who does it because that person has the passion behind it uh, to do it the right way. Um, so I think it shocks people sometimes because they think, you know, they want to see some, you know, big Italian fat guy come out. Hey, forget about <laughs> it. Forget how you know, you're doing. Shut the yeah, fuck yeah. up. I don't, I don't really know what they expect, but, um, you know, when you're really passionate about something, I think it transcends a lot of things. It's like, it's like when you see, like, uh, let's take, for instance, Eminem. He's one of the best rappers ever. He's white. People are like, oh, my God, he's white. He raps. Well, he's still a passionate human being who has a cognitive mind in order to think about what he wants to do. Tiger Woods golfing. Oh, you know, Bobby Wood can't golf. It, it's just, I guess, I guess it makes it an anomaly in a way. But at the same time, I think people as human beings transcend the color thing. You know, like if. If, you know, you would come to my restaurant and an Italian guy would cook you uh, pappardelle bolognese. Yeah. And then I would cook you a pappardelle bolognese. You put them side by side and you didn't know who cooked it. I'm sure you would say, wow, this is amazing no matter what. So um, I think it, it's uh, just like, I guess, our society thing. People try to categorize. People want to put. It's, it's just easy for people to compartmentalize something. Yeah. You, you know, I guess I just in general, people are like, oh, you know, you're a Republican this. And, or, or you're independent, this, they can put you in a box and say, all right, I, I kind of assess this situation and this is what he is and this is what he does. But I think, you know, when you really look into stuff, it's much deeper than that and it's much uh, more intriguing and cool, but it's effort. So people have to kind of look into something and, you know, kind of be perplexed or say this and that. And I think that's where that kind of comes from in our society in general. Yeah, another another uh, 
compliment that uh, Chef de Paola gave you was he said there's there's very few people in the Northeast who know more, including me, about pasta, making pasta, than you. You, you are a accomplished, complete chef. But when it comes to pasta, you're really in a league, uh, a special league. Uh, is that something you focus on, or is that just another part of the entire experience? No, I mean, I always, even when I was younger, I, I always liked pasta. And I would try to make pasta, even when I wasn't really good at it. It's something like, I guess, when you develop a language and you study, study, and you have to get over that hurdle is where it's almost uncomfortable, where it's almost like you have to push yourself to that certain point. Um, so I've always liked to make pasta. And I decided um, owning an Italian restaurant that I would make our pasta fresh. And I, I went to Philadelphia, I'm going to say like maybe six or seven years ago. And there's a guy who wrote a book called Mastering the Art of Pasta. His name is Mark Betri. Yeah. So I wrote him this long email and I was like, listen, I, 4th of July weekend, I close the restaurant. I would like to come down there and stop in your kitchen. So I go down there and uh, stay at a hotel, catch an Uber to his restaurant. This guy is like world renowned. If you look up Mark Betri, he owns restaurants. He's in Vegas, but his, his, his famous restaurant in Philadelphia. Yeah. So I go stash for him. He has a pasta room. I'm blown away because I'm just like, dude, this is this is it. I go in there, I have like a nine course meal, unbelievable. I go upstairs, I like make some fresh pasta, and I was making pasta at my restaurant, but I just wasn't at that level yet. I was I was still a newbie because a lot of times when you work for a chef, you kind of inherit what they do. But sometimes when you go into uncharted territory, you have to kind of figure it out. So I was yeah. reading a lot of books, whatever. So long story short, I go to Philadelphia, I work in his kitchen for free. I basically, you know. I'm in this hotel, get up in the morning, go, you know, on my vacation. Um, and one of the days, you know, I'm working there and I'm like, oh, won't you do anything else? And he says, yeah, could you mop the floor? Now, here I am, you know, grown man, yep. own my own restaurant, have 18 employees, head chef. And this guy asked me to mop the floor. So I stopped for a second and I said, yeah, no problem. Where's the mop in the bucket at? And I mopped the hell out of that floor, Dave. I, I, I mopped that floor, Dave, like it was like it was the love of my life. Because I said, you know what? There's, there's strength and humility, and people don't realize that. And he was, test gonna... he was testing you, too, don't you think? Of course. Of yeah. course. Of course. But at the time, people are emotional. People react certain ways. I could have been like, are you kidding me? I'm working for free. I own my own restaurant. I'm a big shot in my neighborhood. But I said, you know what? This guy was gracious enough to invite me to his kitchen. Mm-hmm give me information that I didn't have. And this guy's a legend. I look up to him. So I grabbed the mop and I mopped it very, very, very good. And I explained that to my employees and the young chefs that are coming up, their strength and humility. Before someone said, yes, chef, to me, I had to say, yes, chef, to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Before my sous chef cleaned a fry later, I had to clean a fry later for somebody else. So it's almost like a rite of passage. People don't understand it. You know, everybody wants to, they see the, oh, this guy's a chef. He owns a restaurant. He flies around the world. He went to school in Paris. He did this, but no one understands the humble beginnings. Yeah, and you what you have to do in order to get there. Washed a lot of dishes, prepped a, a lot, lot, of, lot of vegetables, <laughs> and a lot of fruit. A lot of work. Oh my gosh! I had dish pan hands for years. Gosh, and then you're, but like you said, it is a rite of passage. It, it is a, uh, and I'm sure that that uh, he remembers you, and and I'm sure there he's asked a lot of people that to do that, and they've said no. Or they balked for a long time, and he's going to remember that too. Yeah, absolutely. So, long story short, I do read a lot of books. Um, you know, we're such in a great information age now. And let me just can I just stop you for a second? Do you read a lot of books, or are you constantly reading books and constantly watching videos and constantly trying new things? Or when you say you read a lot of books, it's it's your life, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I just want to, I want to let people know that because I know that about you. I wasn't asking yeah. that question. I know that about you. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, but, but you know, there's, there's things, and there's so much to learn about pasta because the different regions, you know, in the north, they, they make more pasta with eggs. In the south, they make more pasta with water and semolina. There's different grains of uh, the, the flour. So, there's just so much to learn. And there's, I want to say there's probably 5,000, 6,000 different shapes of pasta depending on what region you're in. Yeah. So all, all of that to me, it's just like, like, you can never learn enough. You can never learn everything. But it's such a great challenge for me that when I come up with a new shape that I can make, either through my pasta extruder or by hand, 
Um, I remember one person commented on my post on Instagram that, man, you're making all that pasta by hand. That must take a long time. And I was like, man, this guy just doesn't get it. Like, it's not about, it's not about taking a long time. It's me being able to do this. Yeah. Me, me, me being able to produce it. That's, that's the. And what a difference when you go to a restaurant and you have like pasta from your place that, that's, that's uh, handmade and homemade. It just makes such a difference. Let me ask you a question. I have type two diabetes. I'm, I'm, I always say I'm Italian, but I'm only 25% Italian. But I grew up with a very Italian food, French food kind of, with some Polish mixed in. But I love pasta. I mean, I love it like I, like I love my life. And I, I, and I went four or five days a week. I would have pasta every day. I was always never fat, but then I got fat. But I, I didn't. I stopped a lot of other things when I got fat. But now that I have type two diabetes, I'm constantly trying to find ways. Not all the time. Because I still make a point to eat pasta once a day, um, once a week. I mean, once a, uh, once a day, once an hour, once a week. You know, because if I cut it out completely, I'll, I'll go. You know, I'll be naked on a on a church tower with a high powered rifle. Right? I'll go crazy. Shriveling, just Absol- like yeah. Shivering. It'll be it'll be uh, it'll be ugly. But what can I replace pasta with? Especially when I'm making authentic. I mean, I love simple. A lot of times I'll make I'll take some some olive oil anchovies, red pepper flakes, and put it over pasta, and that's all. Yeah. You know, what excellent. can I replace pasta so, with that doesn't have the carbs? So, so we've been doing a lot of research on that because we have a lot of, you know, people that, like I said, the internet is used, so people are more conscious about their health. People are studying their health. You know, people want a longevity. Um, we do spaghetti squash. So we always have spaghetti squash. Um, it's a textural thing, though. It's very difficult to try to get the same texture in something. We have like gluten free pasta, and you but know, does gluten does pasta. gluten free? Because it's just for my own edification, because I don't know any of this. Is gluten free pasta still has carbs though, right? It has some, but not as much. Okay, because the protein, the protein, and the wheat is what gives it the carbohydrates. So you have to do a little bit of research on your own. Because I'm not, I'm not a doctor, and I don't know 100. Um, percent but there's certain things that are car- carb-free pastas. Like they make pasta. Originally, like I said, pasta was made in China. It was made with rice flour. Yeah. Uh, so you're looking for the, 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 the gluten, the carbohydrate part of it. Um, there's low-carb pasta you can get. Like I said, I don't know. Like for me, I would rather have a little bit of pasta than like maybe you just got to put your, your, your quantity, your portion size down a little bit. Yeah, but how, bit. how long have we known each other? You know me. Yeah, I'll yeah, get yeah, a little you're, thing you're, and I can't stop. Yeah. The other day, oh, by the yeah. way, that's the, the steak the other day, the, um, the, uh, the steak that yeah, went, the yeah, it was the filet. It was, no, it wasn't. It was the, uh, with the vinaigrette. It was sirloin. the sirloin. Uh, was unbelievable. I waddled out of that place. I had a hard time fitting through the door because I couldn't stop being the re- eating the riet, and I f- had to finish that. And then the steak, I'm like, I'll have half and I'll bring it home. And then I didn't. I had it all. And then that stupid dessert menu came along, and then the whole thing fell apart. I just oh, come I, you come I, dessert menu stupid now. Huh? Yeah, okay, I couldn't. Steak, I, I couldn't I stop. <laughs> like, I see where we're going with this. Um, so yeah, I mean, as far as like low carb, I think you should look into some things. They make pasta with all kind of stuff. Now they make pasta with lentils. They make pot, and that's where you're getting into like milling different flowers. So I actually just got a, a mill, uh, a little mill that mills flowers, and I'm working on some stuff now to do different flowers in order to make pasta. But the problem is, is trying to bind it together is very difficult. So I mean, in the future, you will see some different stuff from us because I'm working on it. I have actually a little laboratory downstairs in my house, and I'll invite you over one day. Um, there was an extra kitchen in my house and I tore all the stuff out and I got some Italian pastry uh, pasta boards from Italy, shipped from Italy over here. And I got pasta machines. And when I was in Bologna, I went shopping and got every little tool you can think about on the internet, like little wheels to cut, little uh, cavatelli boards, everything you can think about. All and the cool, you have all the cool toys. Yes. So, but I mean, I, I walked around, I, I was walking around Italy. I mean, I was like from store to store. Um, so when you know, we'll maybe we'll do a, a a little sneak peek preview of my pasta laboratory. I can bring the cameras, um, and that'd be great. Yes, 
which I, well, I mean, I think is pretty impressive. We're actually putting the tiles in the room now. Um, you can come in and check it out. Cause I pretty much, it took me about three or four years to acquire all the stuff that I have, but we're working on doing different pastas. We're going in different directions now. So, you know, you never really master anything, but you can always kind of be, uh, innovate and try to do certain things. And that's also depends on my customers like yourself who are, you know, diehard customers who love our food, who might say, Hey, do you have a, a low carb one? Do you have a, a gluten-free pasta? Do you have, um, something like that? So it, it challenges me as a chef to try to come up with something that satisfies them the same way. Yeah, it's interesting because I, for me anyway, I can't have as many carbs because my body doesn't process, process sugar. It, it Carbs turns to sugar. My body doesn't process sugar the way it should. Health, right? That's about my health. But when I think about food and I think about health, and to me, and I joke about it a lot, but eating food that gives me a certain level of joy and there are places I go, and, and Tosca is one of the rare places I go. I can name five or six on, uh, in the whole world. It gives me joy to be there. And isn't that joy giving me something that's making my life and my health better? I know you're not a doctor. You're not a psychiatrist. You're not a psychologist. You're a, a, a chef and restaurateur. But it, 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 there must be some truth to that. Um, I definitely concur. You know, so... I I think it, it creates memories and you have memorable meals mm -hmm. and there's something so um, I guess like warming and caring about like when you truly have a good meal, it's just, it's like, you know, you can remember your grandmother making a turkey when you were a little kid that brings you back to that. Yeah. That smell. Kind of like, yeah. The smell, the moment, just like, yeah. you know, you're around your friends and your family and you're eating, I guess, you know, they say, you know, we're breaking bread with each other. Yeah. There's something that just kind of, like I said, transcends everything else at that moment when you remember that meal. You're like, oh, man, I really want to go back there because I really enjoyed the meal. I had a nice glass of wine. The pasta was great. They made the bread fresh. It's just one of those things that just kind of it transports you back. Yes. It just brings you to a point in your life of just like, you know, yeah. happiness. Happiness. You know, you yeah. Go, yeah. That's the best word. It's funny. Funny you mentioned that because I went to Italy back in, in the spring. I went to Puglia to a little town called Monopoli, which is where my grandmother's and her family are from. And I've been to Italy a couple of times, but I've never been to that region of Italy. And I went to, uh, first of all, the, the dialect was very similar. And as you know, Italy is six, one language made up of 67,000 languages. But the other thing was I went to this restaurant and the minute I had their, their, their red sauce, their, their meat sauce, it was almost like I was in my Nona's kitchen again. And I, yeah. I asked the chef, and I said, well, you know, what, what are you doing? They seared, the por they seared pork, and then they would shred the sear, and that's what my nana did. She shredded the pork, into the seared pork, into her sauce, and then put the rest of the pork in and let it... Like a true, like a true ragu. Yeah, it was, really was a ragu, and it was... Re and I mean, but the minute I tasted it, I could see her table with the olives and, and the peppers and the... And the pastas and the veal and the chicken and everything else you would have a big long spread and it, it's almost like you can close your eyes and taste it and it made me happy which yes. made me healthy so i'm thinking maybe i should just come to tosca three times a week eat like a pig and just live forever sounds good to me hey it sounds like a deal right <laughs> hey number sounds one like number one cause of death in the united states heart attack number one cause of death of heart attack is high blood pressure. Number one cause of heart disease, of high blood pressure is stress. Go to Tosca, eat some of Chef Cousin's incredible food, relax, you'll live forever. People say that's not true. I'm living proof. Am I dead? No. And I've been at this a long time. Well, you know, I think, you know, in our society, uh, it's a hustle and bustle society. Everybody's trying to make a living. Everybody's trying to do what they're passionate about or what they want to support their family and everything else. But there's moments, like you said, you can actually sit down and enjoy yourself. And, you know, food brings people happiness. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's essential for us in order to get nourishment. But when you're getting nourishment and you're, you know, transported, you know, from the smell, the, the wine in the glass, the, like you said, the shredded beef when you're looking, the owls on the table. There's something about that. It's just, you know, you kind of like not, you don't think about your problems or your issues or whatever you have. You're just kind of in the moment and you're enjoying it. I think people really need to focus on, you know, being happy. And if I can provide that with food or someone can come in and say, you know, when people say to me, that's the best meal I've ever had. Or, that's the best salmon yet. 
I've ever had. Or I remember when I was in Paris in the eighties with my wife on our honeymoon and we had a duck dish that tastes just like that duck dish. That makes me happy. You know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm evoking, I'm evoking like these emotions in people and this, and this feeling of happiness that are, you know, truly make up for, you know, the, 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 the days that aren't so great. The days that, you know, the lady at, at table one who's complaining about the parsley or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? But <laughs> there's always the, the one, one too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that, that comes with, that comes with the territory, yeah. you know, as you know, just like you in, in anybody's business, they have to deal with, you know, entitledness. They have to deal with issues, problems. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I don't guarantee I'm going to solve everybody's problem when they walk through the door, but I try to be a great host and a, and a good chef and a good restaurant tour that, you know, listen, we welcome you come yeah. down, sit down, have some bread, have some wine. Eat, eat a nice, you know, chicken palm dish or something, you know, chicken, whatever. And uh, that, I, I guess the bigger picture, that kind of wins over all the little minute things that that you can't control. Yeah. And before I let you go, I do want to mention your staff is is not only now, but has always been great. So, Thank you, yeah, the overall experience is fantastic. The name of the restaurant is Tosca. It's in Suffield, Connecticut. Uh, if you're within two hours of Suffield, Connecticut, put it into your GPS. It is worth a two-hour trip. If for some reason your plane is diverted to Bradley and there's a four-hour layover or a two-hour layover, you can hop in an Uber, be there in five minutes and 18 seconds, or is it 22 seconds? Just about. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're, pretty, we're pretty close. So a lot of my friends from Northampton area, when they're going to the airport or dropping their wife off or picking their wife That's off. That's me, or dropping, yeah. <laughs> or dropping their kids off or or catching a flight, they'll stop at Tosca because the proximity is so close. I, I literally think maybe we might be seven minutes down the road yep. at the most. And, and my um, wife flies every Monday and Friday, so you're closed on Monday, but uh, I, sometimes I try to talk for her and I leave it on Tuesday or Sunday instead. <laughs> I like I like your attitude. It's good. Um, but yeah, Dave, you know, we appreciate you uh, coming in as a customer, you know, always promoting our restaurant. And, you know, we promote you and, and we enjoy what you're doing. I'm going to actually get some of that barbecue sauce. I'll tell you Joe. what, you should watch their videos. These two women are amazing. When their father, and I hate to digress because I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm looking at the clock thinking I got to wrap up, but when their father got ill, they closed down, and their father was their, the, the, the patriarch. He's the, he's the guy who, for, and I think the grandfather actually, and the grandmother are the ones, but they had to close down. One, one of them went to nursing school, one of them got a, a bookkeeping degree. One of them took care of their father. The other one took care of all the books. And they went out and they installed rugs and they picked up trash. These two women did whatever they had to do to take care of their father. And then wow. when their father finally <laughs> passed away, sadly, they went back in and they are killing it. Hardworking. I, I absolutely love them. They are just the two. I mean, Mary was just one of my favorite guests Ever and if you had this barbecue sauce, I, I'm a big barbecue. I love barbecue sauce. I like white yeah, barbecue, barbecue sauce, by the way. I'm a big Alabama so, white so, sauce. I mean, that's awesome. And also, I see the the olive oil from Manny. I know Manny. I got the Manny's olive oil. Um, um he actually used to be a customer of Damien at the original Carmelinas. I remember that way back when, years and years ago. I remember him coming in for you know the crazy Alfredos that we used to make for him. Um, so that's awesome. Yeah. You know? We're having a great time. Chef, thank you. I've been trying to get you on for so long because every chance I get people, and I always get people, when are you, you're always talking about Tosca. When are you going to have him on? But you're really busy, and I really appreciate you taking yeah, the time. Yeah, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate you and what you're doing. We'll see you soon. Chef Kevin yes. Cousins, owner and head chef, obviously, at Tosca Restaurant. We're going to take a quick break. This big, bald, Caucasian forehead will be back right after this. Take care, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll see you day. soon. Hey, thanks for joining us today at Cooking Something Good. Special thanks to our guest, Chef Kevin Cousins, Tosca Restaurant, Suffield, Connecticut. If you're within a 10-hour drive, it's worth the trip. Or if you have a long layover at Bradley Airport in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, seven minutes away. Or if you're dropping someone off and you want to sit at the bar and have a great meal and a drink after you've dropped them off at the airport. Tosca Restaurant, I think you're going to love it. Cooking Something Good is a production of the CSG Broadcast Network, and all rights are reserved. Any rebroadcast or retransmission without the express written consent of somebody, I don't even know who, but somebody is prohibited. Actually, if you want to use it, go ahead. I won't say anything. Although now that I've said that, I've said something, so it might be too late. 
Thanks for joining us today. Remember, food is fun, fun is food, and it's always foodie fun time here at Cooking Something Good. We will see you next time. Bye now.